Okay, I think we can just start. Welcome back. Hope you uh, had a good lunch. And uh, this afternoon, we actually have two consecutive sessions. The first one is a presentation uh, from Thomas Stockhammer and myself about the topic Ultra HD quality of experience with MPEG Dash. And then after a short break, uh, well, I will give the presentation, but then we have a coffee break. And then we have a panel about uh, MPEG Dash and, uh, from a broadcaster point of view with a few panelists that we will introduce after the coffee break. But now it's Thomas up to you to start with your talk. Thank you, Christian, and thanks for attending after lunch. I hope uh, you had a good lunch. So the topic, as Christian mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about MPEG Dash uh, and a couple of other standards involved in this and how it basically used to provide what is called Ultra HD quality. So, but what, it, what we mean about this and what is defined and how, how we define this, uh, it's going to come up. So I'm a consultant for Qualcomm. I mostly work in standards, but I'm also involved in the corporate and R&D in some developments. Um, so let me just give you a brief intro into uh, what uh, Qualcomm is having in terms of product and technology. So we consider ourselves being a leadership in digital media and what is a, an, an relevant aspect and is getting more and more important is media experience and the innovation in this area. So uh, our platforms are mobile platforms primarily um, and along with this, we basically provide a significant amount of technology which support uh, quality of experience in um, video streaming, video delivery, video processing, um, and so on and so on. And that comes uh, from aspects which are on the delivery aspects, but there are aspects which are on the processing aspects, on the coding aspects. And a couple of aspects which I'm focusing on here is actually our involvement in MPEG Dash, uh, a couple of transport technologies, H.265 uh, or HEVC, and the uh, relation to Ultra HD. Supporting to this are, for example, audio. We have a significant amount of, of audio tools supporting around 5171. We also provide uh, post-processing. We have Miracast enabled for wireless display support, augmented reality, trust zones, digital rights management. All of this is enabled and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's relevant and it's a necessity to basically provide high quality video on mobile platforms. So, uh, our engagement is basically on both ends, and I want to basically have two parts of the of the talk here. So the first one is the involvement in standards, and the other aspect is about uh, what we how we support this then in our products and how we optimize. So we are heavily involved in standards and drive and uh, global open standard. This is relevant, and examples are mentioned here uh, with HVC dash MPEG H audio in 3GP, uh, IEEE. Uh, the collaboration is major industry players, and that enables us to ensure that we have globally interoperable standards. Our products are global, so this is one of the relevant aspects to have standards, which we can build on the products. Then we differentiate our products by innovation and optimized implementation approach. And that's the, the optimizations go towards mobile and wireless usage, and uh, some uh, keywords are here, efficiency, power consumption, the usability, quality of experience, creating wow effects on mobile and end device. And, uh, one of the topics is also that have a deep integration with mobile uh, operating systems and applications to enable app developers uh, to use the tools on the native platforms. And all of this and the combination of probably a lot of more things uh, enable and basically support the creation of this new uh, high-end experience for video consumption on wireless devices. And what is holding here for wireless devices is not necessarily limited to wireless devices. Our focus is just at this point of time on uh, wireless devices uh, for, for the reasons of where our product focuses. Um, so, mobile video streaming. So, we like it. Uh, Qualcomm has a history. We did MediaFlow. MediaFlow was not really successful as a traditional broadcast system. The whole idea of internet TV, over the top, interactivity and all of this is really great. So, this is a survey which is already pretty old. And it basically shows that if you compare traditional broadcast TV and internet TV, that in a survey, and you have some categories, that basically in um, basically all of the categories, internet TV with the ability of having control when you watch it, uh, have the ability to select content, the, uh, the usage, uh, the controllability, portability, and so on and so on. All of this has a significant benefit, so uh, consumers like it. The issue which was happening and was is, is still obviously a problem is the issue of quality and the lack of quality or the 
the differentiating quality between traditional broadcast and internet TV is something which still um, a couple of years ago had basically the, uh, the pendulum towards the uh, traditional broadcast. But with all the advances in um, optimization, the delivery uh, for internet TV, this is actually shifting and that is one of the prime focuses to focus on the quality aspect to improve this to make sure that we get on par uh, with traditional broadcast on the quality and then basically use all the additional features in order to uh, create these new experiences. The first aspect is about standards. I'm focusing on Dash. Uh, we have involvement in other standards such as HGVC. I come back on the product side. I think HGVC is being discussed heavily in this uh, conference, so I don't want to go into this. On the standards perspective. so. If you look into DASH standards, then I have here, uh, 14 organizations. They all do something on DASH, so it's kind of confusing. So uh, the organizations are like AMPEC did the core standard, the DASH Industry Forum, involvement of HPTV, 3GP, um, other groups who do certifications, and so on and so on. So uh, basically, we have 14 standards organizations which are listed here. You might have seen this one before. So the idea is that we have 14 competing standards, so let's create a, another one to make sure that we uh, show how to use it. So actually, that brings me to the Dash Industry Forum, which uh, I am involved in and Qualcomm is involved in, um, but also giving some structuring and background. So it's not like as these are competing standards, they all have uh, justified their application standards. They do different purposes. The core standard is was done in MPEG Dash. And I'm just listing this here. I'm not going through this in details. What you see is that there's a core specification which defines formats. Uh, there are supporting tools around this uh, in terms of conformance and implementation guidelines. And then uh, it basically enables to integrate other AMPEG specifications as well as specifications which are developed outside uh, AMPEG, such as the file format, uh, such as common encryption, such as uh, video carriage, such as the video codex itself. So there's a significant amount of tools which are basically reused to enable um, over-the-top streaming using ampeg Dash. It's not like uh, one standard where you can read everything. It's basically the ability to reuse tools which already exist. Uh, this is giving an overview of what is basically deployed today. So basically we have an initial version of the Dash spec which was published in 2012. The Dash Industry Forum created interoperability points which basically use the initial a subset of the initial uh, spec and created extensions for codecs, for uh, DRM, and so on and so on. And actually, if you look into the HTTP spec, this is actually a subset here as well, but uh, HPTV in 1.5 did some extensions, also including metadata, uh, in order to support the use cases they had in mind. At the same time, SwitchGP, which was very early, also involved in the development, has a subset of the, this standard here. So all of them are based on the ISO-based media file format, and basically, this um, gives a first overview of what is currently used, deployed, um, and, and standardized. So it's nothing which are competing standard. They are basically using the core spec and do some subsetting and extensions in order to create then a system around this. Um, if you look into the Dash 264 specifications, we have done an initial overview of what is supported in a client in order to enable some uh, basic and to some extent also advanced streaming use cases. Uh, more focus was put on on-demand use cases, but life is supported as well. So you have HTTP as the core protocol, you have different addressing schemes, you use the ISO-based media file format as a container format, we enable common encryption and multiple DRMs, uh, and then we have basic audio and video tools to have stereo audio, to have uh, HD video, uh, we support subtitles through simply timed text, um, and we basically ha have all the features to have seamless experience when you have to switch in bandwidth variations. So that's basically the core uh, initial deployments where it's uh, supporting tools. And I come back to this in a second, but supporting tools are available here. Um, the next aspect is basically additional work is done. So standards never stop, maybe just for the self-purpose once in a while. Uh, I have some good motivations why this is continuing. So what we get from this basic interoperability points, we get uh, new aspects which lead then to extensions to what has been done before. And a couple of those to be mentioned. So we have new codecs with HGBC, with new audio codecs, uh, also new formats, not only codecs. So we get, uh, we get 4K formats, we get uh, new color uh, spaces, we get uh, 
higher bit depths, HDR, and so on and so on. Uh, Multi-vendor DRM, which is kind of supporting the basics, but there is uh, still a significant amount of work also uh, together with ultraviolet here. Um, what is also uh, a heavy push is to use uh, Dash not only as a HTTP unicast delivery, but also integrated into broadcast technologies, in, uh, especially now in the LT broadcast. I have a slide on this later. What we see where improvements are relevant, necessary, and um, we need experience, uh, deployments, uh, tests, and so on, is in the area of reducing latencies for live services and getting robustness into this. So there's work ongoing in this area. Uh, we get new service requirements in terms of accessibility, closed captioning, subtitling, uh, also service continuity. Another topic where it's heavily worked on is the ability to have ad insertion with the ability to do targeted ad insertion, uh, targeted to specific users, to groups of users, to uh, regional areas, and so on and so on. And also deployment experience basically leads to further work um, in the area of DASH standards. Christian also has some more slides on some ongoing work um, in, in, in DASH standards. So uh, this basically just drives this. Um, the Dash IF efforts, I just want to summarize it quickly. I have more slides than I have time to go through, but I still want to list it. So the Dash IF is not there to create new standards, competing standards. It's m much more in order to support the deployment of uh, what are we defining in interoperability points. And for this, um, this group has kind of is dedicated to develop tools. And I have four tools which I'm listing here. So there's documentations and test cases, and then there are four tools which are basically, all of them are publicly available, available without any fees attached. Um, and um, so let me quickly go through those. So these four tools, and I have a, a diagram here which shows a bit on basically what we, what we have here. So there's a tool set based on op open source to create Dash-based content. Um, so this is one aspect. Then we have a conformance software which we use to test whether this content is conformant to what is in the spec. And that conformance software can also be used by content providers to test their content offerings, whether this conforms. Based on test cases, basically, we then create test vectors out of here. We check that those are conforming and basically make those test vectors then available as conforming test vectors. Another aspect is basically our uh, reference client, which is developed uh, as a JavaScript uh, uh, reference client which integrates into browsers, so Dash.js. And this reference client is basically uh, also used to test our conformance vector. So we basically try to keep the features on par, develop those in parallel. Um, there is major players involved in this Dash.js development, for example, Microsoft, uh, even Google and Akamai are involved in this development. I think that's a great tool because it basically gives support for all the top streaming in a, a significant amount of platforms um, uh, using the browser as the, the player tool, uh, so using the media source extension as basically the feed into the browser. Uh, what I said now, basically, I have some more slides on this, which basically show we have around 80 test vectors today, supported by 23 test cases. They are available here. You can go there. They are playing with a reference client, um, and you can use those to test your own players. Um, there is conformance tools, which you can use to test your own content offering and run this through the validator. There's an online validator available here which you can just plug in your uh, MPD, and then basically this uh, tool will basically validate your content offering whether it conforms to the Dash.if environment. There is the Dash.js reference clients, which I mentioned here. So here are the references to this. It leverages the media source extension and also the EME of the W3C, and it's enabled today in Chrome and uh, um, the Internet Explorer. Other browsers are on the way. Um, if you have a question on Safari, I don't know, but it might happen as well at some point of time, we hope so. Um, okay, and the last thing is a tool which is just recently started, um, like half a year ago, where the Dash IF collaborates with the European Broadcast Union to create a workflow based on open source, which enables to create a um, content offering based on Dash. So, there is uh, supporting tools like web-based user interfaces, platforms, and then we use encoders such as FFmpeg. We use uh, Dash authoring tools based on GPEG and Dashcast. Uh, and, and basically, this creates a workflow to uh, generate different types of service offerings, including on-demand and live services. The uh, workflow is documented. 
And um, we are testing this now. This is available to a smaller group right now for testing, but this is going to be made available to a larger uh, audience in order to kind of uh, enable content generation uh, and integrating uh, new features. So the Dash AF basically is supporting all of these tools by work of the members in the group. And there is additional ongoing work happening where we um, do uh, technical promotion uh, and support activities. Um, there is the progress and maintenance of the tools. And then there is technical work, what I had mentioned before, ad insertion, improved support for live services, integration of higher quality formats, especially focusing on HEVC. Uh, work on the backend interfaces to support the DRM interfaces between content providers and DRM offering. And then further recommendations, how you can enable adaptive resolution switching recommendations uh, for encoding. Um, the usage of Dash in broadcast and hybrid environments. And then we are uh, open to collect new issues and use cases for which we then generate and extend the tools in order to make this available. Um, okay, so that's basically my standards aspects, and I would want to now go over to the Qualcomm products, which basically use and integrate standards, but at the same time obviously have a high level of optimizations and integration. One of our flagship products is our Snapdragon 805 processor, and the processor has a lot of uh, tools available and packaged along with connectivity tools, uh, cameras, display. So for the display, for example, the 805 uh, enables uh, Ultra HD resolutions in terms of displaying. The camera is basically able to uh, shoot uh, 4K content. And along with this, on the package, you get the multimedia core processor where we integrate um, the, uh, the codex and delivery mechanism to enable this uh, streaming application. So I have a bit more on this. I just want to show you uh, what is enabled in this 805, which is the latest of our products. Okay, uh, so video and HEVC. So what you get in terms of video features on the Snapdragon 805, and that's just kind of snapshot, but what we have is we have support for what we call HQV. Um, it's a post-processing to um, where uh, we worked with uh, Hollywood uh, creators, uh, what they use for post-processing. So you get a significant improvement of the quality. And we, uh, this is the first tool to introduce a 4K HVC decoder mobile uh, platform uh, based on hardware-based decoding. And that enables that you really have an extremely low power HD video pl uh, playback, HD and UHD playback. And along with this, you have all the tools for connectivity with LT, LT Advanced, uh, the display, the graphics support to really create this ultra HD quality. And just last week, there was this block which you can refer to. So the Samsung Galaxy S5 uh, with the LT uh, Advanced support is launched in Korea and that integrates this um, uh, 805 uh, processor and basically enables now to capture and then stream alt, uh, 4K Ultra HD, uh, including also the tools which are mentioned here. So this is not just like a roadmap that is happening and, and, and available. Um, at the same time, uh, to get content uh, on, on mobile and wireless devices, you need to have advanced delivery uh, mechanisms. And the whole aspect on Dash, we committed into using HTTP, we committed to using TCP, we um, basically can interface with CDNs, we can use existing delivery mechanisms. Still, based on this, there are obviously challenges. So the, the networks in mobile conditions are not perfect, and you might experience this for yourself. So watching video mobile is good quite often, but there are issues happening uh, quite often as well. So you get from like a really mild or kind of relatively relaxed network conditions to really tough network conditions once in a while. And network conditions are basically mostly driven if you deliver through TCP by the packet loss rates. And you see packet loss rates in the area from zero to 2%. And this is wireless. We know that also on uh, fixed net access, um, some slides from Akamai, that this is not necessarily just in mobile. This also holds for uh, uh, fixed access networks that you have packet loss up, uh, rates up to this ranges. And then the other aspect which kind of, again, makes things problematic are round trip times because that kind of uh, uh, affects your TCP through throughput. So operating in this a variety of conditions, you need tools to make uh, delivery robust. 
Uh, other challenges is that in mobile, especially, that you have time-varying bandwidths, where the variation is not only due to congestion, but it's also due to the uh, mobility uh, of the clients. So you have variable bit rates which you have to deal with. So these are variations over uh, multiple uh, tens of seconds, which you typically can see, and the bandwidth verge in the in ranges which are uh, typically quite significant. So what are we doing about this? So one thing is that we basically committed to integrate a Dash client fully into the other Snapdragon platforms uh, with the Qualcomm Stream Manager, and that uh, is offered to optimize rate adaptations, which is really optimized to its mobile transmission, both Wi-Fi as well as 3G and 4G networks. So I said integrated. And the second thing we have is a, a more generic tool, which is not Dash specific, but is uh, at this point of time combined with Dash is a transport accelerator to uh, offer accelerated HTTP TCP transport for higher through throughput. And that enables also faster startup, few stalls on the network error conditions. And that is uh, anticipated to be integrated in one of the next versions. Um, it's, it's not yet integrated now, but uh, with all the tests we're doing right now, it's something which uh, has a matureness to move forward. I don't want to spend time on the Dash client. I think you understand what's happening here. We use basically the uh, adaptivity to ensure service continuity, and uh, the adaptation is happening to really make sure that we uh, exploit the available bandwidth on the network. Um, the transport accelerator is uh, something which uses multiple TCP connection. That's basically complementary to the dash performance. So the core aspect is to use multiple TCP connection in order to get more consistent quality and reduce the stalling. This is basically a, an average playback rate. If you would use an Android regular HLS client and our optimized client under the same conditions, and you see that you basically can have a factor of, uh, I think that's a factor of six in throughput at the, at the same conditions. And what I have here is a video, it should come up in a second, which basically just shows this. So on the left hand side, you see the STA support, on the left hand side, the uh, no uh, transport acceleration. And you see that under varying network conditions up here, that the throughput of the green STA is typically significant higher. So both observe the same network conditions. And this results down here in a consistent fluent playout. Whereas here, without the trans transport acceleration, you see uh, stalls, lower quality representations, and so on. So that's basically something which is um, an optimization, which is fully conforming with the standards. There is no extension. It's really an optimization on the client. Uh, another tool um, is that we uh, use and integrate um, and work with operators on establishing uh, a more scalable distribution of especially live services using LTE broadcast. And that is also based on Dash and HEVC, where we use an existing file distribution protocol to enable broadcast distribution. Um, all of this comes along with our deliverables, um, and there are commercial services already launched in this area, and there are more and more trials happening. So LTE broadcast is available on the Snapdragon processors, and it will basically be something which we expect happening um, more and more to offload um, over-the-top traffic on broadcast solutions in LTE. Um, and you have access to the latest tool, and that's basically how I want to conclude this, because our Snapdragon processor, um, we have a... a Intrinsic has announced a new mobile development I'll platform let the guy speak. based on the Qualcomm Snapdragon 805 processor. This next-generation mobile development tablet features a quad-core Cray 450 CPU, all-new Qualcomm Adreno 420 GPU, and the latest Hexagon DSP, and an array of new functionality not yet available on any commercial device. This cutting-edge tablet is brought to life on a 10-inch WQHD display and supports Qualcomm technology, such as Hollywood quality video post-processing. Other features include hardware-based H.265 4K video decoding and Qualcomm Vive 802.11 AC Wi-Fi for seamless media streaming, while the Adreno 420 GPU enables visually stunning games with geometry shaders and GPU hardware tessellation. Developers can also expect 3 gigabytes of RAM, 64 gigabytes of storage, USB 3.0 connectivity, dual infrared cameras for 3D gesture recognition, a fingerprint scanner, and seven microphones for surround sound recording and ultrasound pen and gesture support. Along with the latest Android operating system is Qualcomm Technologies' preloaded advanced profiling and optimization software. This suite of tools allows developers to track hardware-specific power consumption and visualize system performance. 
The MDP tablet with Snapdragon 805 processor gives developers early access so their apps can take full advantage of the most advanced mobile technologies. For more information, visit Intrinsic.com. So, the relevant aspect here is that basically uh, app developers can basically start optimizing their applications and using the tools available on the hardware, which is going to be shipped over the next couple of months. Uh, so all of these optimizations can be done today. This is accessible um, and it's a highly powerful tool getting access to all these Ultra HD tools. So as a summary, basically what we do uh, as, a, as a snapshot, so that we have a dash client integrate, we have our transport accelerator, we're using LT broadcast and we having HVC and 4K and that's throughout supported through on our mobile platforms and there is an accessibility of this for app developers to use this and um, make use of the tools to create this uh, ultra HD experience. And I conclude with this one. Thank you very much and hand over to Christian. Okay, thank you, Thomas. As we're running out of time, let's make a smooth transition to the second part of this presentation since we are the two of us presenting. Here, uh, I'd like to give a quick introduction. I will skip over most of those slides because Thomas already introduced Dash and how it works, and then quickly go to the Dash metrics. So that means how uh, you can enable a Dash client to collect metrics that then can be used for quality of experience, evaluations, or adaptations according to the quality. And then there is also a new way to make dash quality aware by introducing that information back into the stream so that the client can make informed decisions about uh, how to switch between the different representations to have a higher quality of experience. But then, I mean, we should also spend a few words about what is QE and how to ev evaluate it, and then there are some conclusions. So the outline is a little bit uh, uh, not working here on the presentation. But okay. I mean, you know this kind of slides. So video is uh, predominant on the internet. Real-time entertainment is, is something that is coming more and more and consuming uh, a lot of the internet traffic in peak periods already more than uh, 50%. So I will just kind of s uh, skip over this one. Uh, how it works, I mean, I don't have to tell you that. I mean, you just cut the video into small pieces called segments. You have multiple versions, which then the client selects based on the given uh, bandwidth conditions and basically what's in the client, the so-called adaptation logic that basically uh, uh, requests the appropriate segments in time based on the current context conditions is something where the most intelligence of a client uh, is, is included. But how can the DASH standard or standardized formats help to increase the quality uh, one step is to have some kind of metrics or a kind of logging functionality at the client that gives you means to communicate to another instance as blogging server or whatever, uh, what's going on on the client side. In Dash, there is an NXD, uh, which is a normative definition of uh, semantics for these kind of metrics according to different observation points. Uh, so if you have the Dash access client, that basically is the one that issues the HTTP requests uh, and uh, gets the responses and handles that over to what we call here a Dash enabled application, which then in the end feeds into a display for uh, rendering purposes or whatever. So the first observation point is more about what's coming in from the network side, starting from the HTTP layer and everything that is below. Typically, well, HTTP is implemented on TCP, so you have everything that comes with TCP and the HTTP request response messages that can be locked here. Like when a request has been issued, when the response is coming, it's more or less the timing information. And then after the Dash client, so the Dash client gets the segments and hands it over to the uh, media demuxing, decoding, rendering chain, uh, so that's in the encoded media domain that gives information about which type of media that is. Okay, audio, video, the modality more or less, the codex and so on. And then a lot of timing information, when things have been de delivered, decoded, and the presentation timestamp. And most importantly, which kind of representation. So which bitrate, which resolution, which language or whatever 
is, is delivered here. And the same can be also foreseen at here at observation point three, uh, uh, but in the decoded media domain. For that, Dash defines semantics of these metrics in terms of kind of key value pairs. The actual syntax is actually not defined because that might be defined elsewhere or could be even application specific. But still, we thought within MPEG that's a good idea to have at least a common semantics so that people can, can uh, use that later on. Uh, in particular, here we have a lot of information from TCP, HTTP. Uh, representation switching is something that is, is of interest. In. So which representations are played when that can be used then to derive how often you switch between different representations, how often you have quality switches, for example. Buffer status is something that is important. If the buffer is always full, you could probably switch to a higher representation and playlist information. Uh, and as there are quite a few metrics, so for some use cases, you might not even be interested in all these metrics to be delivered from the client. So you might want to signal to the client to say, okay, I'm just interested in a subset of these metrics. And then you can use within Dash the so-called metrics descriptor. So that's part of the MPD where you can signal within an attribute a list of keys which are more or less defined here. You say, okay, client, please report that back. I'm just interested in this one. Uh, you can even say that, okay, I'm not interested for the entire session. Maybe, okay, for a 24-7 uh, live stream, you're probably just interested in uh, some peak hours. So you can even define a timing period. Uh, and also you define the method of reporting. As the syntax is not defined, you basically refer to another specification. And for example, in 3GPP, they have defined something, how that reporting, how the entire system works and can uh, do that. So now you might ask, is there any client supporting this kind of metrics? In MPEG, we have a reference software, which is called LibDash. That's more or less a open source library that provides you an, an, an interface into the standard. It doesn't solve the adaptation and everything like that but it helps you to implement your own product and that provides support for these kind of metrics. So you can enable that within this uh, library. It's open source available and is a basis for products like we have done here uh, in our company in Bitdash, which then has included also the adaptation uh, logic. Speaking about the adaptation logic, you probably want to inform also the client about what is the quality of the content itself. So there are different kind of metrics that define, okay, this content has a better quality than the other. There are different metrics like we have listed here, but you want to signal that also to the, to the, to the client so that the client can make informed decisions based on that information. There are two possibilities where you can do it within the MPD. That's always possible. The MPD is XML. You can extend it. You can introduce your own descriptors. The standard itself is very extensible, so you could introduce that very easily even in a proprietary basis if you wish to do so. But if not, you can come back to MPEG and we could even think about standardizing it or within the segment. And that was actually the preferred method now within MPEG. There is a new standard coming up, which is currently still in the development phase that enables the carriage of timed metadata metrics for the ISO, ISO based media file format. And that defines a box for a video quality metrics that more or less you can associate metrics like PSNR, structured similarity index, video quality metrics, or perceived video quality. There are, might be even more that could be associated to any existing streams, and then the client can make decisions based on that information. Additionally, within that part is also something which is just highlighted here as a keyword, a green metadata that could be used at the client side to reduce energy consumptions, but it's a kind of similar time metadata metric like the quality metrics. Now talking about quality of experience, uh, we never really looked into what is QE actually, how it is defined. The ITUT, for example, has a definition. Uh, I was working here within a uh, research cluster project that even defined it as the degree of delight or annoyance of a user of an application or service. Very high level, I mean, guess you might agree on that. Others define it on the level of acceptability, but, but here is more like the degree of delight or annoyance. I think that captures it a bit better than 
just pure acceptability because you might accept things but you're still not happy with it, right? Uh, and then also what are defined like factors influencing the QE and the features of the QE. And that gives quite a comprehensive list of what are the actual factors that might impact the QE or what features are uh, within this term QE and you might select it for your application domain. But how do you evaluate it? Typically, you have subjective quality assessments. And again, in the ITUT, there are a lot of different uh, guidelines uh, how to do that within a laboratory. You have a fixed environment. Uh, everything is controlled, but uh, is also very cost intensive. If you don't want to spend so much time and cost, there is another method which is coming up right now that is about crowdsourcing. So you give it over to the crowd. There are special platforms out there like Amazon Mechanical Turk or the microworker.com platform that can be used for that and you simply uh, let users around the world or you might select a certain geographic area to, to, to assess the content, your application, and uh, you get feedback from them directly. In terms of Dash services, we all know like startup delay should be kind of low, buffer underrun stalls should be ideally zero, of course, and quality switches you, should, you don't want to have it too often, and the media throughput should be high like also Thomas presented there. And that's actually what we have done in the study. And I'm presenting you something that uh, have been uh, not presented elsewhere. So that's kind of a premiere for that. So we have done a crowdsourcing studies on this micro worker platform. We have limited to uh, Europe, North America, and India. Uh, and then we looked into different Dash clients. So there is one that we have developed as I was a kind of research in the uh, university background, we have developed a JavaScript version there, which is referred to as Dash Dash JS. And then there is the Dash Industry Forum, uh, the reference client from the Dash Industry Forum, which has much more functionality and uh, is, is, uh, implements uh, the, the standard tools in a much more comprehensive way than, for example, this implementation does. Uh, and then the standard YouTube player which has also certain Dash features. We basically took uh, a given client, we have an open source content here, Tears of Steel trailer, a sequence thereof, and we uploaded that to YouTube. We checked, okay, what is YouTube doing is uh, transcoding it to different resolutions and bit rates. We have created the same content for uh, the other two Dash players, put that on our server uh, in, in, in Klagenfurt, in Austria, and then, we were setting up such a crowdsourcing campaign on this uh, microworker platform where people could log in and could see uh, the video stream or they, they had some pre-questionnaires at the beginning about the age, gender and so on that we then can use for the analysis. And then in the main evaluation, we had a single stimulus evaluation. They saw just the video streaming either coming from YouTube or uh, using one of the other two players where this content is located uh, in, in Klagenfurt. They were just accessing it over their own network conditions, whatever this is at that moment, within the browser environment, of course. Yeah. And in the end, they were uh, giving a rating uh, on a scale from zero to 100, which reflects their mean opinion score. Uh, also, the client was collecting kind of statistics like a startup delay, the, the media throughput at the client, uh, the, 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 the buffer status, and all this kind of stuff that we could evaluate at the end. Uh, as this is about crowdsourcing and it's not working in a uh, controlled environment, uh, people might simply cheat. So they might participate there and just do give some kind of strange rating or even uh, no, do not participate very hard, honestly, so you need some kind of screening techniques. One option is to use browser, uh, browser fingerprinting so that people can participate only once. Another one is you measure the presentation time because some users just go there, uh, use the slider to move at the end of the video and uh, do the rating. Some even give strange QE ratings, so they never do any rating or they just rate the extreme values, which is kind of suspicious or you might check it with this pre-questionnaire where you ask, okay, where do you live? 
And if this is not within these countries, then something is wrong. So uh, this kind of thing, you can, you, you can screen out people uh, from, from the evaluation. The results uh, are shown here, uh, which is, gives here the average stars, that gives here the average representation bitrate, meaning the throughput at the, at, the, at the client, the startup time, and the QE as reported during this main evaluation. You can see here from the different players, for example, like, like YouTube has a very low startup delay. Uh, our player here has a very high startup delay, but the QE is kind of similar. So that kind of indicates, well, the startup delay probably does not have that much impact on, on, on the QE. But you have, a, in both cases, a high media throughput, and the number of stores is uh, lower compared to the Dash Industry Forum player, for example. That means also if you have high number of stores, the QE is kind of low. So in total, we had about 160 microworkers. Uh, 20 we have screened, we have removed from the evaluation. And we can see that something like that is known already in the, the, the literature that startup delay does not really impact the QE as long as there are no stalls. And uh, stalls and average bitrate, they have an impact on the QE. But still, it's not clear which one has a bigger impact. Probably stalls, at least not from this study. There are other studies which came to the conclusion that stalls have a high impact, a higher impact on the QE. But that's something that uh, can be investigated later. The mean opinion score uh, for the three different categories, we further divided Europe in Europe East and Europe West. And you can see here that, for example, Dash Industry Forum has consistently a lower uh, mean opinion score, while in Europe, uh, the, Dash, the other Dash JS implementation is kind of comparable with what YouTube delivers. But if you go to India or US, Canada, you can see that YouTube has a higher QE than the other ones. The reason is simply, since we upload that to YouTube, and YouTube, they have a content delivery networks in, in, in the background, uh, so they might have some servers close to India and, of course, North America, which have a, a, a better, a lower startup delay, hence better quality of of, of, of experience. That means that if you add something like a CDN, it could even boost your QE. Coming to some conclusions or some general conclusions, Dash is successful thanks to, I mean, you know, client-centric design. You use the existing infrastructure. You have efficient codecs. The network provides good support and a standardized representation format is available. We have seen based on the measurements, so if you go back this has a very, very simple adaptation logic and is comparable here with what YouTube delivers. So a simple yet effective adaptation logics are feasible. You can do it better. Here are just some keywords that uh, I haven't introduced that much, but I can give you some details later on. The QE of Dash focuses mainly on startup delay plus stars and on the quality switches and the media throughput, and that's something that uh, could be interesting for, for you guys to work on that or, 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 or look for solutions for that. And that brings us to the end. And we still have, well, a couple of minutes time for questions before we go into the break. So are there any questions, Thomas and myself? No questions, I guess. Um. Regarding the criteria for QE, um, do you think that they are the same if you are on a mobile network uh, or on a, on a fixed network? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. So just to repeat for the, for the microphone, the question is whether the QE is different for mobile or for fixed environment. Yes, there is a difference. We haven't looked into that in, this, in these evaluations, but of course the context in general is kind of big, right? So you have devices, you have user preferences, and, and, and whatever. Some are very interested in, 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 in the World, World Cup. In the England, I understand, people are no longer interested in that. So, uh, so, so, so you see, the context makes really a difference. And, and, and there are a lot of different things you need, you need to take into account. Uh, we haven't looked 
it, in, in this evaluation, we didn't investigate it in, in, in detail, but there are some people who are looking into that. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we are here during the break, and then after the break, there is a panel, uh, again about Dash, with uh, Thomas and myself, but we have also three others from the broadcasting point of view, from a network manufacturer, and from a CDN provider. So I would, would be happy to welcome you again in about 15 minutes here in this room. Thank you, Thank you very much.